Welcome to this webinar hosted by Tordex entitled Bringing UIs to Life with Crank Software and Tordex. My name is Brandon Shibley. I'm a solutions architect at Tordex. And I'm joined by Jason Clark, VP of Sales and Marketing at Crank Software. Jason will be presenting the webinar today and giving us a nice look at the graphical UI development with Crank Storyboard Suite. I want to thank everyone for coming, and I would also like to thank our technology partner, NXP, for sharing this webinar. The demonstrations you'll see in this webinar utilize Toradex NXP-based system on modules. For those of you unfamiliar with Toradex, we specialize in embedded computing solutions, particularly ARM-based system on modules. We have two families of SOMs within which the modules are pin compatible and interchangeable. We perform hardware and software development in-house. We generally guarantee 10-year product lifecycle support. We offer free technical support directly from our developers. Sales are also handled directly by Toradex and our products can be ordered right from our website. And finally, we have offices throughout the world allowing us to serve the needs of regional markets with local warehouses and local sales and technical support. And now allow me to introduce our partner, Crank Software. Many Toradex customers implement HMIs or human machine interfaces and develop graphical UIs for their products, which makes Crank a very natural partner for Toradex. They are very attentive to the developer experience and they value software portability, which nicely complements the pin compatible family of system on modules from Toradex which are interchangeable and allow upgrading or downgrading embedded computer hardware without the need to redesign the rest of the system. Use of Crank software together with Toradex products results in a very flexible solution set, allowing hardware and software to be readily adapted, ported, and evolved as needed without the need for substantial redesign. And I'm sure Jason will highlight these and many other features of Crank software. So without further ado, I'll hand the presentation over to Jason Clark, of Crank Software. Hi, everyone. Well, you can see my screen now. Okay, yeah, so now your screen's up here. Thanks, Brian, for uh, introducing me, and thanks, Toradex, for setting up this webinar. Crank Software, Toradex, NXP, all the names you see there, we, we work together really well, and, you know, so it's a natural fit for us to be uh, doing this here with Toradex today. Crank Software and Toradex are very similar in a lot of different ways, and uh, their ability to allow you to scale up the processor while keeping the, the same board really aligns with what we do in software, it's allowing you to scale up a product line with different functionality and features uh, depending on the rendering capabilities. So there's a, a natural pairing between the two of us here. Crank Software, our main product is our storyboard suite, and that's what I'm going to be showing you here today. So I'm going to do a bit of a slide deck to under, help you understand where we fit and why we're different from other options out there in the market. And then rather than go on and on with slides, I'd rather just show you a live demo of building a UI and pushing it directly onto a Toradex IMX7 from NXP. So Crank Software, we have been in the embedded, uh, we've been a company for almost 10 years now. I think it's our 10 year anniversary this year. We come from an embedded heritage. We've been all been working in the embedded systems for a long time. I'm one of the co-founders also here. And we've taken a lot of the knowledge we've learned from there and taken it to the embedded systems after seeing how much people struggle with putting UIs on their systems. Let me just walk through some of the issues that are affecting and sort of position where we are in this. So most people are aware of this and you're probably already getting pushes from your marketing team or whoever. Um, you know, the desire for a rich animated UI is always growing and it's not just in the consumer device market. All the markets where you're actually showing your UI to end customers, the expectations have increased immensely, um, you know, mainly out of cell phones. The phone market is really driving the embedded space and their desire to have richer, more compelling UIs. You know, when somebody comes up to a touch screen and they don't care whether it's their phone or point of sale system or whatever it might be, the expectation is the same functionality that their phone has. Even though that expectation is probably wildly uh, misaligned with the realities of how an embedded system is built, the number of engineers working on it, the uh, price points for building these targets, and the uh, processing power of the CPU being used on the uh, different uh, modules. So 
but with all that said, it doesn't really matter. Expectations are expectations. So the job of the embedded systems now is to figure out how they can come closer to meeting those expectations and giving that strong, compelling user experience. Because of this, the project teams have evolved. It's no longer a bunch of engineers building a product anymore due to this change in desire to, uh, you know, show stronger, richer UI. You know, now all of a sudden you have designers, uh, user experience, uh, different project managers, and a lot of people concerned with how the UI is coming together, what it's going to look like. And, you know, the biggest problem with the UI is everybody has an opinion on it. So there is a lot more sort of fingers in the pot sort of dealing with how this comes together. And a ramification of that is the graphics content is no longer statically, it's no longer static. It is always iterating. You know, no matter what you're doing, sooner or later, somebody's going to have a reason to iterate that UI. Either it doesn't feel right on the hardware, it doesn't work in the user experience, user testing, feedback comes back in. Or as always, uh, somebody from senior management walks into your office one day and tells you why it's wrong and how it should be fixed. And all these issues come into the fact that the UI always evolves. Um, there's always changes. People always want to see differences and changes. So what we at Crank Software have sort of worked around is a bunch of core beliefs. And the first one is designers and developers are equal. Design change is inevitable, and the expectations are always increasing. So what does that mean? We want to build a product that supports designers and engineers working together in a single unified workspace that allows them to communicate and talk with one-to-one uh, -one what they're saying when they say changes, where they can actually go ahead and do them themselves and sort of maintain their area of expertise. So, you know, the designers can control the look and the feel, and the engineers can control the behavior of the back end and how the system um, is populated with information. You need to be able to embrace the design change. You know, being aware that it's going to happen, that's the first step. Uh, <laughs> and then how do you deal with it? You know, so many systems, they, they spend a lot of time coding out a very nice, elegant, uh, well, elegant looking UI. But as soon as somebody says change it, it's so intertwined and so tight to their system that it's very impossible to iterate inside of there. So understanding that your system will change and how are you going to manage that change is a very important part for people to understand. And the last is we are built exclusively for embedded systems. So we are built from the ground up for embedded systems. Uh, you know, a lot of solutions out there when we started looking at this were um, when people started realizing they wanted designers more involved, going back, you started seeing things like Flash start to come into the embedded space. A lot of people try and use HTML5 or other solutions along that vein. They're desktop solutions trying to be fitted for the embedded space. And when that happens, there is a lot of work and pain that goes into that to make it work. Um, some companies have made it work, but those companies have probably had giant teams that have been willing to invest the resources needed to do that. The ideal is to actually use a solution that is built for the environment you plan to run in, and Storyboard is that. So, so I'll start walking through some of the highlight features, and then rather than just talk about them, we'll show them to you. So the first thing is we, we are focused on designers. To bring designers into the fold, it's not a one solution. You know, you have to do a lot of things. You have to bring their content in. You have to enable them to make changes. And then you have to be able to make those changes come back to the embedded team. So you have to look at it through an entire life cycle. And not just a single point. You know, many companies, what they've done in the past is design comes in. They create a design, and then they pass it off to engineering. Then it goes into sort of darkness. The engineering team takes that design, and months later, they pop out what they interpreted the design to be. And by that time, they may be much closer to release, and there's very little time to iterate. So we wanted to make sure that's not the problem here. So as I said, they were built for designers. So the first thing we do is we take in assets that come from designers. So we can import Photoshop files. We can import uh, 3D FBX files, true type fonts, PNGs, bitmaps, whatever it might be. All the content that the designers and graphic uh, artists generate is able to come in. Most of our designs, the last stop before going to the embedded system is Photoshop, and that's because Photoshop is usually the, the best tool once you get to a pixel-perfect design. I know other people use Illustrator and other tools up until that point, but once you get down to knowing the exact resolution and you want it pixel-perfect, Photoshop is usually that stage. 
So what we do is we actually import the Photoshop file directly into our system. We'll pull in the Photoshop file, we'll maintain the hierarchy, the naming, the position, the fonts, and the visibility settings that were set by the designer. This allows the designer to effortlessly move into the storyboard environment and continue working on their system where they can begin to add behavior and animations. Once they get in there, the first thing they usually want to do is start animating the UI and adding these pieces. To enable the designer to do this, you know, we don't want them having to write scripting or coding these animations. We have provided a full featured animation timeline like they would be used to in other graphical products like uh, After Effects and such. So they can put everything on a timeline, preview it, play with it, slide it around, manipulate the easings and the tweens um, completely to fit exactly what they want. And this is an area where when the designers do this, it, it's really amazing what comes out. You know, you see all these uh, embedded systems and they use sort of these generic button libraries or something like that and they all have this sort of standard feel. But if you look at what's going on inside the markets today, like when you touch your Android or Apple phone, every button has a bit of a feel to it. It has a little animation to it and such. And the designers will really put so much more effort into this. Um, and when you see some of the animation timelines that the designers pull off and how detail oriented they are. It's, it's very amazing to see. I'll show you building animation today, but uh, my powers are not as strong as theirs, and I'll just do something pretty simple to give you the concept. We are scripting enabled, so we do enable users to use scripting, which is very powerful, especially when you're simulating on the desktop, uh, going to the target. We do use Lua for doing this. Um, Lua is used in the gaming market and we pulled it from there, but it's very modular, very small, and very fast. So it's, it's a very nice scripting language. It is not mandatory. Our scripting is not uh, not like some like the JavaScript libraries or such. You see, we are not, that is not a fundamental underpinning. It is just an integration we have that enables people to have familiarity with scripting, such as a lot of designers and such, that they can actually leverage our scripting interface. We also have it built right into our debugger, so you know, sometimes the the issues with scripting on embedded systems is the lack of insight. Uh, we actually provide the full Eclipse debugger for C programs, but for Lua inside of our product. So you can actually walk right through something and get full vision into what's going on. So embracing change, how do we do that? How do we, how do we leverage and manage the iteration that happens inside of an embedded system? Well, the first thing we do is we are not the only UI solution to do a Photoshop import. But a lot of them, that's the end of their integration for designers. You know, they pull in the Photoshop file and then the engineers take over. So all it really does is give them a little bit of placement and, you know, a little bit of, they save them a, you know, a couple hours or a day of work of positioning images and such. The problem is, was, as I said, the design changes, it iterates. And, you know, it's not going to be long before the designer comes and says, well, here's my updated Photoshop file. And at that point, the, the engineers have to look at it and say, well, can I piecemeal put this in? Or do I have to start all over again? Um, and that's problematic. What we've done inside of Storyboard is, you know, identifying this, we've added in a Photoshop re-import, which allows you to take the new Photoshop file and we will compare it to the old one and allow you to either completely update it with all the new assets and positioning and bring in new assets if there are new ones available, or you can piecemeal cherry pick the changes that you want. So you can just say, I only want these three images in this here, and yes, update them. So you can fully control what you want and what you want to take in. But, you know, this is, this is very important as that iteration happens because, you know, the design work is going to happen in Photoshop no matter what. We are not trying to replace that end of the work. You know, those are the tools the designers use. Let them use their tools. They are built from the ground up for that. The same way we're built for adding the behavior and getting it ready for an embedded system. Team collaboration is also a very important part. So this is collaboration either between different locations of a team, different groups of a team. Um, you know, just you put two developers on a project, you have to sort of the collaboration piece. We have done a lot of work here to deal with that. So we allow you to carve up your project into smaller spots and deal with the um, making it so that there's not as much conflict between check-ins. But sooner or later, two people will want to change similar parts of the project. And that is where we've added on our graphical compare module into our system. So this allows a designer or an engineer to look at UI changes from a tree view or from a graphical view. And this is another thing when I talk about the importance. The idea of adding designers and having the UI, the UI team or design team have 
greater control over the UI. You know, not many people will debate that, but the logistics of it is where a lot of products fall down. You know, Storyboard has thought this from end to end. You know, if you want these people to participate and stay in control of the UI, you need to have a way that they can actually commit into the engineering workflow, and that is usually centered around some kind of source code repository system. So what we do is allow you to synchronize with SVN, Git, or whatever you might be using. Um, Eclipse is our base, so we can actually use any part, that, any plugin for the team collaboration that Eclipse is already supporting, which is a wide breadth of them. And then we can show you at a high level what's changed between two systems at a tree view, not at a text view, which you would see with normal things. You know, looking at a UI's differences as code changes, you know, it does not always highlight or help people understand what's really changing when they're committing and merging code. But we can actually show it and actually show you a full graphical representation of what's going on at that point. The last part is we are built for embedded, so not to be lost in all the good things we do for designers. At the same time, we are built for embedded, and it's always been our focus and our target market. So to do that, you know, we, we have built an end system. Storyboard is a runtime engine with a data model. So a storyboard designer, which is a tool that everybody works in, simply generates a data model of what your UI looks like, and then we have an engine optimized for each of our platforms that executes it and runs it. It is completely event-driven. Everything inside a storyboard is based around events, and you'll see when I start building it up. It's a very simple model and it's just basically events trigger actions and what you do when you're sort of adding behavior to your system is you're connecting events and actions together. We are optimized for embedded systems so that means we are memory optimized, we can have cache limits, we can have image cache limits, font cache limits, we can preload them, dump them. We're built on a plugin architecture which allows us to add and remove functionality to fit into smaller footprints so we do go across MMU boundaries, so we can support all the way down to the M4s and M7s in the uh, MCU area and up. And this is also very nice because, you know, many customers, uh, if you take, for instance, the IMX7 we're showing here today, you know, there's customers running Linux on it, but there's also customers who might be running FreeRTOS on it at the same time, uh, you know, depending on where they're coming from and their background and their knowledge, what they'd like to do. We can support either of these models, which gives a very nice scalability story, especially if you're a company making products that have a low end, a medium, and a high end, you know, to have one graphical tool that can help you prototype, design, and, ex and you know, release um, is very powerful. Along with our software render that I'll show you today, we also do support OpenGLES backends, along with multiple other backends for, you know, custom and unique rendering technologies. Um, OpenGLS is highlight because it's probably one of the most popular. So if you were today to be using IMX7 from Toradex, um, you know, and you started looking at UI and maybe you felt it was sluggish due to uh, resource constraints of uh, software uh, rendering, you know, you can easily just swap into their IMX6 module, upgrade, and we will give you full access to that. So without doing any changes to the UI, just putting in their module and changing the software rendering backend that we have to the OpenGLS rendering engine that we have, you'd be able to start taking advantage of first then a performance upgrade, but then you'd be able to, you know, if you had support for that, you could bring in custom shaders, you could bring in 3D models, um, you know, 3D screen transitions and such. So all that's available immediately out of the box with no, uh, no really extra effort at all. So it does give a nice scalability story too, you know. Maybe version 1, you go to lower processor, you feel you want more. It's a very easy shift up the uh, product chain. This slide here, I don't want to go into too much, but the basic idea is storyboard is an engine. We didn't do interpretive data models, so you know the question always comes up: How do I do what I need to do? You know, it's it's great you can make these rich graphics, you can control all the look and behavior, but you know sooner or later my system needs to do something, and that is where our storyboard I/O comes in. What storyboard I/O is is a messaging API that allows you to send events back and forth. What this does for you is it sort of pushes you to a nice clean architecture of sort of a model view controller architecture where you have a nice clean separation of your presentation and your business logic. There's so many advantages that come out of when you do this. Um, you separate the two, which means you know your engineering team and your UI team can easily work in parallel um, once the API is defined. They can both push along and move at their own speed and they're not sort of lockstep in serial development. 
um, you know, iterations, changes, new features to the UI are easily added without impacting the underlying base team. Um, you know, and it's it's just it's uh, if you read UI books and everything, it is usually the the recommended method for developing a user interface is a separation between presentation and the underlying logic. We do go over an I/O mechanism there. It's you know, it depends on the end system what we use, but we do have the ability to tie directly to C and smaller systems and such too. So. It is not a restriction in any way. It is just a recommended way to going, especially on your higher level systems. But, you know, I always like to let people know we don't push you or force you. If there is valid reasons, there are ways to go tighter to the metal and have pieces call directly into C functions too. So both ways happen. So when it gets down to connecting your, your I.O. to your end system, this is how you do it. Our last piece I wanted to touch here before jumping into actually showing you something real is, you know, just more stuff on the type and build for embedded. Like we have been looking at this for years and how to make sure that we cover all the different steps. And you know, some of people's concerns when they use something like a an engine sort of data model runtime is the lack of insight and vision. And you know, we, we understand that frustration and we have built our system completely around that by, you know, providing performance tracing information, giving you all the information whenever something's not performing exactly as anticipated that you can see exactly where it is. The worst thing that can happen in an embedded system is uh, you see this in UI projects no matter whether they are developed with us or anybody else is when they don't have enough insight people start doing random things to try and solve UI problems. They just start moving stuff around, changing things, you know. But without an idea, and you know, that, that's the worst case, you know, it's you need to understand what the problem is and we do give that complete insight so when something's taking a long time, you can actually see down to all the sections of our rendering pipeline where that time consumption is. Also built in here is our event capture playback and screen capture. Combined, they make a great testing environment allowing you to headlessly drive your UI testing so you could actually do nightly regression testings on a UI and dump all the images to validate that they look exactly as anticipated. We also have a lot of debug logging and application reporting allowing you to immediately generate reports on your UI um, to be shared amongst the team. Without further ado, I will jump into our storyboard product itself and start working with you live here. So, this is storyboard, what it looks like when there's nothing in it. <laughs> um, if you're familiar with Crank and Storyboard, um, this may not be familiar to you because today I, I like to uh, go on the risky side and uh, oops, and I used our 5.0, which is ex not going to be released for another month, but it has some nice features that I wanted to show off. And, you know, it's pretty stable now. Well, it's more or less stable. We have customers using it and everything, so... Um, I don't feel it's that big of a risk, but uh, it's ready to go. So you're getting your first look at our storyboard 5.0 here today. So let me minimize this and start with what I was talking about Photoshop. So here I have a pretty simple UI, and this is what we're going to build up today, and I'll push it on to hardware right up in front of you. So this is a Photoshop file graphic designers made. It's a home automation screen. The end designer has built up many different parts of it, um, all broken up into groups. These groups will map to storyboard layers, and he's added different looks for a security screen, a calendar screen, a setting screen. Some of the other things you might notice in here is there is special naming to bring things in as buttons. So this minus button here has a minus up and a minus down. We will recognize these special naming conventions and other num names inside of here and do smart things with them. So in the case where we see up and down in the same name, we will automatically turn it into a button for you, so without any extra work, it's already done on it. So looking back at that project there, we are going to start off here in the storyboard and click on our Photoshop button and import it directly into our system. So here I'll just click it. I have two versions, so I will show you an updated version later. Um, I'm going to say bring our text layers in as text uh, in Photoshop there's a text and a graphical representation of all your fonts, so I'm going to say actually use real fonts so they're editable, and I'm going to create a new project called Home Auto. So if I hit finish there, immediately my entire Photoshop representation is brought into storyboard and everything is broken apart into its individual pieces and ready to be utilized. So up here in our top bar, I actually have a wireframe view to sort of remove the presentation of it and just let you see the core boxes of what's going on. 
This is a great view to actually get a better understanding of how your UI looks in space-wise and hit zones for touches and such. Um, but you can see here all the work is brought out. Um, down here you can see all the images that were all the individual components of that Photoshop file are all down here ready to be utilized. And you know, if somebody wanted to grab something else and bring it into our system, they can simply drag it out of here. So you could add new images and everything you want, and then just drag them, position them however you want. There's guide bars, everything you need to control these different ideas and concepts. When we imported that Photoshop file, what you're seeing here, if you remember, there's only three different groups inside of the Photoshop file that are represented. All the other ones were put into unused layers. They're available but they are not being used at the time. We took the visible groups that were in Photoshop and we made the initial screen out of those ones. What's nice is because my designer actually put multiple screens in here, I could simply go, I'd like to add a new screen. And you know, some designers do this differently. Some are multiple Photoshop files and we can handle that too. That first dialogue you might have seen, there was other options in there for dealing with that. So here I'll just build up some of the other screens. So I'll do the settings screen, um, you know, there's that module and I can just grab the different components. So we use shared layers idea. So there's a menu layer with those buttons and then the background layer here is called sub-layer in this example. And I made my new screen setting. So if I click OK, my second screen is now available. And you know, I could simply, you know, here's another add screen button and I can start adding them all. So um, security is another one. And you know, sometimes these are much more complicated. This is a, a stripped down solution uh, just to ignore some of the complexity that can happen with larger models and not having to go through tons of layers here for this demo. And then the last one would be calendar. And then we'll put the calendar layer there. So at this point, just from our Photoshop import, um, double click here, I'll bring them up to the full screen. You can see I have all my screens built. So there are four screens that I had from my Photoshop file. They're all built and ready to be started at behavior to inside of storyboard. Any change on a shared layer will reflect across all the other screens too. So if I move this button here, you'll see it move across all screens. So the behavior when added to one is added to all, which is really nice because as I come back here and start adding the screen transitions to these guys, you'll see that if I say add action here to start adding behavior, I can simply only do it on one screen and all the screens are reflected. So the first thing I added action to is the climate button here. So to add behavior to our system, as I said before, we have a very simple model. You have an event, the event's tied to an action, and the action will do something smart. Um, in this case, our events have like things like presses, release, key presses, uh, you know, animation completes, multi-touch, whatever it might be. So in this case, I'm just going to say if somebody presses on that guy, I'll click press, we'll do a screen fade. And we'll do a screen fade over to in this case, it's called Home Auto, the climate screen, because I didn't change it. It just came in as the Photoshop name. And he's going to do it over 500 milliseconds, 30 frames a second at a linear rate. Um, you know, there's different rates you can pick inside of here. Fades usually work good at a linear rate. And there are some other options here that matter more to some of our other screen transitions, like do I move all, do I fade every layer or not when you're doing a fade? It doesn't really matter. So we'll just connect these guys all up. So if I connect that one, I can do it again for the next screen. Uh, now you'll see the, la the freak most frequently picked things start populating to the top. And this is the security screen, so I can pick security, and once again, the same options here. I can also just grab this action here. You can see them listed here, and I can actually control C and copy it. And now I'm gonna, I can just paste it on these other guys, so they actually have the action tied to them. And now I can just come in here in the properties and change them too. So there's lots of flexibility in how you do these different. Uh, ideas and concepts, settings. So right there, I've taken a Photoshop file, I've imported, I've built out my four screens, and now I've tied them all together in behavior. So at this point, I'm ready to simulate. So if I just click on our simulate button here by right-clicking and selecting simulate, my application comes up. And if I click on security, I fade over to that screen. Now, you guys are probably not appreciating the how beautiful that fade looked, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure GoToWebinar is bringing you down to like one or two frames a second, so but you'll just have to trust me these. We have lots of videos showing these, and you can definitely download our stuff yourself and try it too. Um, so all the, all the different screens are connected immediately. 
the next thing I was going to do to show you guys is start building up a bit of a richer animation on something, you know. As I was saying before, when people press on buttons, they're expecting a little more feedback. And this is not only to look richer, but there's actually some usability um, applications for this is because usually when you push on a button with a touch screen, your fingers over top of the button, so you don't always appreciate the up and down and understand whether you actually touched it. Um, and animation gives you a lot more feedback as far as that's concerned. You'll see that, like, especially on Android, you hit a button, you see a little burst happen around that button all the time. It gives you, you can see it around your finger. So what we're going to do is take these big glows here around these two different uh, buttons here, and we're going to change them to be alpha dev so nobody can see them. So I'm going to turn the alpha down to zero. The next thing I want to do is I'm going to make that burst, when you press this button, sort of pop out a bit and fade in, and then shrink back a bit and fade out. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to shrink these a bit. And the other part here, a lot of these things that are inside of here, we've taken a lot of ideas and concepts from other graphical programs. So when I'm going to change this size, I'm going to also want to change the anchoring. So I'm going to ch change the anchoring to the center position while I'm doing this. And that's because when I shrink the width and height, I don't have to move the X and Y position accordingly to, to accommodate for that shrinkage. Um, so if I take off 10 pixels here, and you can do inline math right inside of our system too, they'll shrink down both of them to a smaller size. The other thing I want to do with that image is make sure it's centered, because otherwise it'll clip when I'm scaling in and out, and I also want to make sure the scale flag is set on. We don't turn that on by default, and that's because you know you want to make sure you're aware of scaling when you're doing it inside of embedded systems, especially if you don't have a 3D accelerator or something on it. So you want to make sure you intentionally scale images. But with that all done, you know I can bring this back up, and you can sort of see our guy here. He's both there. So I've changed them both at the same time. So when you multi-select things, we will apply the changes to both things. I'm going to build up the the animation only on the plus right now, and then we we could sort of extrapolate how to do it on the minus. So the first thing for building up a rich animation and the easiest way to do it in Storyboard is to simply turn on our screen record. When the screen records on, any changes I make to the UI are immediately recorded and then added to an animation timeline so I can play with and adjust them. So in this scenario, I'm going to, in my first step, I'm going to change the visibility back to 100%, which is 255 in this case for alpha. The other change I'm going to do is put these guys back to 151 as far as their width and height. So I do that, and then it pops out. At this point, I can say, grab me a snapshot. So it's going to put another section on the timeline. And you'll see when I, when I finish this what that means to it. So I say, take a snapshot, and now I'm working on frame two of my animation. So in that frame, I'm just going to put these guys back down to, oops, back to 141 and fade them out. Um, at that point I can say end my recording. So it's going to say, okay, that's good. What's your animation name? I'll say temp up. You can give it a frames per second. Um, now you should look at your system. I'm just going to say 60. Um, this is a smaller animation that's happening here. Um, you know, without GPU performance, we might not hit that, and we could lower that down later to be something practical. A good reason for this is if you know your board can't carry a certain frame rate, why design for that frame rate? Let the designer see exactly what they're going to see. So, you know, if the board can only do 14 frames a second for a full screen fade, well, then when you're doing that, you should only do 14 frames a second, so you'll understand at design time. So many times people, like, they look at it on their desktop, and then when it runs on the embedded system, they're surprised when it doesn't behave exactly how it is. Well, you're, you're not comparing apples to apples there. Um, if I say OK at that point, right now we have created an animation timeline that shows that burst happening. So what's happening here is the alpha is changing from 0 to 255 and then back to 0, and the sizes of the height, width, x, and y are changing. That'll happen. Everything's happening at a linear rate. That's our default. And the default timing of this animation, each step, is we put it in at 500 milliseconds. So right from there, I can actually hit our animation preview, and I can see that animation happening. So I can you know, reload that and see what it looks like. I can also step through frame by frame to make sure. Now on this animation, that's probably not going to do much. But when you have multiple little pieces all moving together at the same time, walking through the animation is very powerful and allows you to make sure you can clean it and get the exact representation of what you want. 
Um, you know, this animation, the first thing you'll notice is it's, it's really slow. So we do have a scale animation here. So I'm just going to say, you know, scale it by 50% and that'll shrink it down to half that size. Um, the other thing, you know, it, the way it pops isn't as nice as I'd like it to be. And this is where the designers will spend their time. So, you know, I can multi-select here and move them all um, to a line here. And same with here. Um, designers spend their day <laughs> well, not only doing this, but, you know, this is, this is how this animation looks and how it pops. They just don't want some default linear in, linear out. And this is what, you know, I come from an engineering background myself too what I would end up doing. You know, when I do an animation, it's a simple slide and move back and forth. When my design team does an animation, there is so much detail in every pop and piece and so many things are in movement that it just these subtle details, but those subtle details give the richness. Especially when you're using a platform that doesn't have the performance. If you can make those little buttons have a lot of pop and because their clipping area is rather small, you can. It can make your smaller um, boards that may not have the you know, a quad four GPU with an OpenGLS processor, but it could make them look like they do because people just understand that button pops, it really spins, it does things. But, you know, this is all about playing with it and understanding what you can do once you put a little more richness into these UI pieces. So here I can simply put that in. I can look at that animation again and see how it feels now. It has a little bit of a better feel to it. The last thing I'd probably do here is I'd probably look at the rates. Um, and you know, here I might switch to some of our defaults. So if you're using our current release, you just have a preset selection of ease in and ease out module. So here I might ease out and here ease in with the fade and it might just give a bit of a nicer feel. In our newest version of Storyboard that's gonna be coming out, you can actually edit these easing to actually give yourself a little bit exactly what you want. And once again, this is to enable the designers to hit exactly what they want. So many times a designer will sit there in After Effects or other programs tweening the animations to be exactly the way they want. Engineering reproduces it and just flips it over to some default animation library with just a simple, you know, tween that is not what they did. Um, you know, you need to give the freedom to give exactly what they want and reproduce and not compromise on what you're doing. Um, in this case, if I change this to be a custom rate, I just need to save it and it'll come up. And I can save these custom rates as my own name. If I want to say my ease in because I like it better than the default one we give, you can actually save it and it's reusable later. And now if we look at that, you know, it has a lot nicer feel to this button press, you know, so you can see it all. The last step that somebody needs to do here is just like when I added the screen animations on, I just need to say I'd like to add an action to here. And this time when somebody presses here, rather Rather than do a screen fade, I'm going to say do an animation, and my animation is temp up. And at that point, it's been tied to it, so now if I simulate my app, save it, I click on my button, and I get my button press just as I expect it to. So you guys may not be able to see, you probably just see a red dot come out and go away, but it is popping in and out just as I anticipated it to. So what I want to do now is well, that's great. It runs on my desktop. It looks really nice, but I want to see it on my board. Um, so here on my desktop, I have an IMX7 from Toradex running. Um, this is our default images. We have this on our website. Um, so it's just running a bunch of demos here that you can test and try out. So we can download an SD card and put it on your Toradex board and flash it. And uh, all these demos will be immediately available to you. What I'm going to do is take what I just made here and put it on that board. So to do that, I am going to come into our exporter. And I had this set up earlier, so it's taking me a little bit of time. Um, so we are going to come into here. We're going to export our default model, which is called the GAP, which is our graphical application. We are going to SCP transfer it over to the Toradex board. So if you come back here, you'll see the IP addresses match there. So it's uh, 172.16.1.193. Um, password and root root, you know, it's the default board settings. Uh, this is where I'm going to send it to the directory on the target. And once it's down on the target, we also have a, after that, run a script. And I'm just going to simply run a script that will launch storyboard. Um, to see that script, I can, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but just so in case people are interested, all we're doing is setting up three environment variables here, and then we're running our storyboard engine, and it's going to be pointed at dollar one, which will be the launch file of what we just launched. So um, the rest of the options here are just for setting up the 
touch screen with the correct coordinates. So um, let me bring up this while I do it so we can hit apply and run. And now he's going to download that target, and then immediately our UI that we just built up here is on the end target. Now I should be able to touch all the screens, get my fades coming through. And it's probably a little chunky on yours, so you just see my finger jumping around and stuff. But the fades are all coming through, and the UI is acting as we anticipated inside of here. Um, if I come back to the home screen, you're probably seeing a little bit of lag, but I can now hit the button and I can test out my animation. So I tested it on my board, on my simulator, I tested it in the animation preview, but now I can actually see it happening live on the board. So this makes a very fast test and validation, especially when the graphic designers, you know, they have a lot of very rich ideas, but they need to come in line with the actual hardware. So if they're not, if they don't have a way to easily validate their ideas, you can end up going down long paths of things that are infeasible. Um, so having them able to, a designer able to quickly hit launch and test on a remote piece of hardware without having to understand, you know, how to log into a shell and do all these different pieces can be very powerful. It allows them a much faster, quicker iteration cycle and actually testing on live hardware. So what I'm going to do next here, um, what I'd like to do is I'm just going to save where we are right now off to another module just so I can show that to you later. So we'll just save that to a different name. And that way I can actually show you the compare later. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what happens when that day your boss knocks on your door and says, I have a new image for you. The UI doesn't look like what you thought it looked like anymore. So here's version two of our UI. Uh, you see the colors have changed. Um, some of the sizing has changed because now there's drop shadows and such around here. And also there's new icon artwork across the top of this UI. Um, and all the screens have changed accordingly too. So, you know, different screens have different pieces. So what we do with that inside of Storyboard is we can simply say I'd like to import. And down here inside of our import options, we have a re-import Photoshop file. What that will do is it'll come into here, and if I pick version 2, we can actually see it's going to go through and start finding me all the images and who they line up with, and I can actually start cherry picking which pieces I want. So, you know, I want this guy to go switch with him, and, you know, you can walk through, and so this is important because if you only wanted a particular piece of it or not, you can just say, okay, I only want these three images or such, and just pick those ones. Uh, you can start seeing the changes happening live in the background there. So, you know, as I start picking them, it's actually affecting the live model back there. Um, in this scenario, I know everything matches because my designer's done a good job here to match it all. So I'm just going to pick the auto import method and it'll match all identical names. And at that point, my UI has been updated to the new look and feel. But if you look over here in the preview end of the back, you can see that some of the images are in the right place. So I'm going to go to the next, and here it's going to say, well, the following images actually have a change in size or shape. So here you can see my screen, and it's being clipped a little bit. So I'll just say select all the changes. And if I click back to this screen, you can sort of start seeing um, you know, how things move. So they're just slight nudges and shifts that are happening inside of there. If I then go to my next stage, it's going to say, you also have some new icons. That designer has added some new pieces. Do you want to add them to the model? And they'll know where to put them uh, based on that. So I'll say, yeah, I just select them all. I want them all. But here's where you can, once again, cherry pick your, your pieces. At that point, I can say, finish. Say, overwrite the existing files. Uh, yes, I'll delete them and reopen the editor. And now I have my UI changed. Here I can simulate it. Um, you know, my my little animation still works. All my screen transition, transitions are still in effect. Everything's been updated with the new position. Um, and even if I wanted to go and say, well, what does that look like in my new hardware? Because a lot of times the biggest problem isn't so much the UI or such. Maybe the LCD makes it look washed out. Or... So now I hit export to the embedded target. And as it exports, my screen will update, and I'll have my new UI down below. So everything's been updated. I can actually start testing with my new UI. Um, so once again, you're probably seeing a bit of a lag, but you'll have to trust me. Things look good.
So, you know, I have a feel. I can see what it looks like. I can get an idea, immediate feedback on my system. This really supercharges your UI development. You're seeing things immediately. Your designer is controlling it, so it's not an engineer doing it and then going showing it to a designer in three days of what he did. The designer can actually see these images. They can see the changes. The designer wants to change a font. They want to change anything. And, you know, once again, it doesn't have to be. Your company may not have graphic resources, but you're bringing in content from Photoshop files or other places. Um, you can take advantage of it immediately, and, you know, and your engineer can still work in this. We've done a lot of work to make sure both designers and engineers can work in the same tool. Um, I'll minimize that, and the reason I actually did a copy of that other application there was I wanted to give you one quick look at, you know, if I had committed this application into my source code repository in between these two updates, what that would look like. So if I come down here and I click on Home Auto Import, I could simply say compare with each other. This would be the same as doing a compare with a remote version over SVN or Git or whatever it might be. So I could just simply say compare with each other. And this will run and give me an update. So it tells me there was 46 changes made to that file between these two versions. And I can see all of those changes here. So I'll just expand my screen to be full size. So there's a lot of different changes. Um, what I also want to do is give me a graphical understanding of what those changes are so I can see them. And, you know, once again, I could take all these changes or I could cherry pick the changes I want. So hopefully you're seeing that. Um, you know, it gives you a different idea of, you know, what we're able to do inside of here and how these changes come through and how they look. So you can start seeing, you know, inside this one, when I look at the list here, I can see icons were added. I can see the X, Y width and height of the climate button were changed. Same with the security button. And I can have actually have a much better understanding of what has happened inside of there. You know, if I click on, you know, these icons, you can see they're on one side but not on the other. So anyways, this enables designers um, engineers or anybody to actually have a much cleaner and stronger understanding of what the system's doing and how it's coming together. So let me close that. Um, I think that's all I wanted to show here today. I think I've probably shown you a lot. Um, I will jump back here into PowerPoint. Um, you know, so there's a lot of richness inside a storyboard. The main part is, you know, it's built at a level, and I think many of you can appreciate this, of what I was doing were not complex tasks. But these things inside of coding and other pieces could take a long time to perform. Um, we have made it so that, you know, either a designer or an engineer can sit there, and, and it really comes together when both actually sit in the same tool, and they can actually collaborate and speak one-to-one -one on what they mean when they're talking about changes or perform them themselves. Um, there's a lot of information we have. If you want to learn more about what we do or see the, the demo that I'm showing you here live on real hardware, you can go to Toradex's website and, you know, um, I'm sure you can easily find. Uh, we have the IMX7 demo image posted on our website, uh, but uh, we will be hopefully posting more soon to IMX6 and other parts that uh, Toradex supports. Uh, Crank Software does have a full 30-day valuation, so not quite <laughs> a full version of what I showed you today, except our 421, our actual release version right now, is what you would see if you downloaded it, but it would be a full feature, and you'd be able to do everything I showed here today from there. Um, that's, that's available, and when 5.0 is released uh, late February, early March, it'll be the exact same thing, and you'll get exactly what you saw here today. Um, demo images, as I said, there are demo images on our website. Feel free to check them out and download those too. And we do push a lot of our content to YouTube. So, you know, if you want to see more about how we do other parts of the systems, whether it's translations, uh, you know, deeper stuff on animations, Photoshop import, uh, running on different hardware, uh, different RTOSs too, that's a big, uh, another important part of the piece here. Um, you know, definitely check that out. Um, so. Once again, uh, thank you to Toradex for setting this up and giving us a mind share with your customer base and allowing us to show what we are capable of and what we can do on top of uh, your hardware. So. 
Okay, thanks, Jason. This is uh, Brandon again from Tordex, and I want to thank you again for um, giving the webinar presentation today. And we're going to have a Q&A session now, um, so use the question um, panel inside of GoToWebinar to ask any questions you have. Um, I'll take care of um, uh, reading the questions aloud, and we'll let um, Jason answer all your questions. So while you do that, again, I just want to um, reiterate that um, you know we we saw a nice demo or presentation of the um, capabilities, um, and over the webcam you saw that there was um, most likely it didn't come through with a high degree of uh, you know frame rate and fidelity. So um, again, I want to just reiterate the check out the Crank Software YouTube channel to see some of that stuff um, at uh, you know very high quality video of, of what the tools are capable of and, um, and the animations and such live. Or, um, and uh, also check out, the, you can actually check out the, that demo, demo image for the Tordex Calibri i.mx7 to see it for yourself. Uh, so I think that's a great option to, to see what the, capable, uh, the software is capable of. And so we'll start um, answering questions here. Um, the, First question we have is the software for Mac only, or do you also have Windows or other operating system versions available? Yeah, so when you go to download Storyboard uh, from our website, if you go to 30 eval, when you, um, you know, if you fill in our, our sheet, you immediately get emailed with a download link and a license key, so there's no questions asked. And uh, upon getting there, there will be three options, so you can develop under Mac, Windows, or Linux, so whatever your preference is. Uh, you know, probably Windows is the highest number of our customers. Uh, a lot of us here use Macs to align with the designers. Um, also, it's easier to run Windows in a VM on Mac for testing than it is to run Mac in a VM under Windows. So that, that's why we do most of our work inside of a Mac. It's just because I can run all the different RTOSs or, or operating systems from here. Also, I didn't mention to the, uh, along the same vein is, uh, the different operating systems that we can run on at the bottom end too. Um, I'm showing you here today on a Linux system, but that could have easily been, uh, you know, QNX, FreeRTOS, uh, Green Hills Integrity. Um, we have a whole host of uh, things: ThreadX, Micrium, uh, different operating systems that we support. So we have uh, an extreme, nicely alignment with uh, Tordex's uh, list of partners and such on the. Uh, the operating system, too. Oh, I also forgot to mention Android there, too, um, which is a unique thing I probably should have mentioned during the presentation. When I was exporting, um, I exported our app down to an embedded system, but we could have as easily just exported for a single Windows executable to pass to your boss to look at, um, an iOS application or an Android application, and that's a, a very powerful tool because especially when you want to get mind share with uh, UI changes and user interface flow, uh, you know, to be able to put it on a, you know, tablet and walk into a meeting and discuss the UI, um, you know, especially before hardware is even available. It's, it's very powerful. Okay, great. And there's also a question about the um, RTOS is available um, that Tordex supports, and so you did just answer that uh, at the oh, same time, okay. which is that, um, and I'll just, from Tordex por uh, perspective here, that we have some partners who do provide um, RTOS support on Tordex modules, and so as you heard Jason mention, that would be like QNX, uh, Green Hills Integrity. Uh, we also support free RTOS on, um, for example, on the Calibri IMX7, which has the Cortex M4. Although I can't say for sure that um, Crank would run on the M4, but um, and those are configurations that we haven't tested specifically on our module just yet, but I think that's something that's definitely possible and should be possible based on the capabilities of Crank and what's available on Tordex modules. So it's, yeah, uh, and just to follow up on that, on the Freescale parts, the M4 on their A-Class series chips is uh, not connected to the display, so that's more for back-end uh, computing stuff, but we also do get customers who do want to run um, free RTOS or other RTOSs of a similar nature on top of uh, the the, like the IMX7 or the IMX6 Ultralight uh, 2, we see customers coming from that pedigree and they'd like to move up to the higher class MPUs but still run the smaller RTOSs and yes, we can support that. 
And so the next question is about licensing. Um, we want to know, you know, how you, I guess uh, if you can discuss a little bit how you set price for licensing and also for different markets. Um, for example, I mean, Tordex operates across the world in different countries, so, um, you know, I guess if you can give a little description of how you would um, provide a, a quote on uh, license pricing for Crank. Yeah, so we so how we sell our software. There's well, there's a couple of things of we sell development seats is the main part. That's what you're looking at. Our development seat is all the tools needed to develop a UI for an embedded system. Our development seats are sold with you know a fixed price with a support fee on top of that. Um, the fees are flat across the world, so we're not. Uh, no, upping or downing anywhere. We do have distributors in different areas of the world that sells that sell them. Um, right now, our costing is around six thousand plus support and maintenance. But you know, um, we are about to come up with a major release, so there might be a small tweak in pricing there. So, but uh, you know, just to give you a ballpark idea, the second half is the runtime licensing, and that is something that is more of a conversation we have to have with end customers on units and such. Um, you know, we do ha offer the ability to do buyout scenarios. We do scale with volume, and you know, it really gets into the scenario of what are you doing and how many are you shipping. And our volumes scale very quickly and easily. And you know, um, many people I always find are uh, their initial idea to uh, runtime licensing is always a little. Uh, um, nervous, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, but once they find out uh, our pricing, they usually find it quite fair and reasonable. It's just a way to make sure that, you know, we can offer a pricing that works for somebody making a thousand unit, plus we can work for somebody doing a million units. Um, you know, and we're, that's basically how we do it. But you know, it usually gets into a further conversation to have any, uh, to provide any sort of context inside of there. So feel free to drop us an email. Okay, great. And there's a question. It seems this customer may have some experience with Crank um, with regards to the icon size and Crank 5.0 for high DPI screens such as the MacBook Pro as it compares the, the 4.2.1 version where the icons are um, very small currently. I don't know if you can comment on that. I can't, but uh, if <laughs> whoever that customer is, please feel free to uh, email our support group, and I would get somebody qualified to comment on that, to comment on it. Uh, we did do an icon refresh on different things uh, in our latest version. Um, so I, I think I know what they're talking about, but uh, ideally it's uh, solved um, what they're talking about. It was just, I think it's our launcher icon. When you start up, our system was undersized. Um, which is, gets into a weird Mac settings thing. So it wasn't, I don't think it was inside the product, but we did have a complete icon refresh. Even inside the tool, if you had seen our old icons before, now they're a little crisper, a little cleaner, and we did a whole bunch of work inside of there for our new release. Okay. And so we saw the crank can import uh, Photoshop formats. Um, and there's a customer who works with GSI Maps, and they're curious uh, if it works with other formats, and specifically with KML or KMZ um, uh, type file formats. No, um, well, that KMZ and stuff, I believe, is more um, about positional data and putting stuff. So we we have worked with that for. Uh, different customers um, to plot out things, but there there was a little bit more mapping unique solutions for that. Um, you know, even in auto, you get the same sort of things. We don't draw like the maps themselves, and like when you use a an, an, an automotive solution with a 3D, uh, you know, maps driving you through your city. So that would be another provider drawing those, and then we draw the framing and all the menus and such. Um, then once again, I'd probably have to have a deeper conversation with the customer on that. But the KML and KMZ files, that I believe, are usually about positional data, which then gets down to a map and how you draw them onto there. So there's a, there's deeper questions on there. As far as other formats that we do support, I mentioned uh, we do bring in OBJ and FBX files for 3D content. So today we're using a 2D board. Uh, but if we were using the IMX6 board, we can bring in 3D content, and we have some very rich demos on that showing the integration of 2D and 3D content. Uh, What's really cool about our FBX solution is not only do we bring in the FBX model to give you the 3D model on your system, 
and you know and you can imagine that inside an auto demo where the doors open or we have like some white goods or, or uh, consumer products where you know they might want to do a blow apart of the product and show you a 3D version of it to look at it. Um, we also will bring in the animations directly from the FBX file. So you know when the three designers making it, they're making all the animations to turn and rotate and open different things or move meshes apart or you can think of a 3D robot arm. We can actually import all those animations too and put them directly onto our animation timeline for control. So it's a very uh, unique uh, and uh, strong, powerful solution. Okay, and do you support uh, like, like Illustrator or vector graphic formats? No, we have documents written on moving from Illustrator to Photoshop and best practices and such. Um, as of today, we don't. Um, you know, especially on embedded boards, vector formats aren't usually the strongest solution. Usually, you want to go to uh, a rasterized solution. Um, some of our designers internally, so we do have graphical services available through our company, and so we have a lot of graphic designers on staff. Uh, they use Illustrator, and Illustrator is very powerful when you're starting to do mock-ups of your UI and everything. But as I said uh, earlier in the presentation, once they go pixel perfect, they start moving into uh, Photoshop at that point to sort of rasterize it and get exactly how every pixel sits um, and have a better idea of the framing. Um, if somebody wanted to talk deeper on that, uh, we have some docs written, and we can we have no problem setting you directly up with some of our designers and how they use like things like smart objects inside of Illustrator to move their concepts directly into Photoshop. Okay, makes sense. And um, also another question regarding the Photoshop importation: um, Would would you have to flatten the uh, effects layer or the blending layer uh, for import? Uh, yes, but there's ways around that. Uh, so that is something that we do. So if you probably saw my Photoshop files there, there wasn't a lot of layer effects. And the reason is we don't want to do our interpretation of duplicating what you think is Photoshop. So if Photoshop gives you a drop shadow of one way, um, you know, it's better just to rasterize it and get the exact drop shadow that you're looking for rather than our own interpretation of that drop shadow. Um, but there are ways to maintain the layer effects because flattening your system, so if, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, to flatten it causes you to sort of lose a lot of detail and especially going back to edit it later. Um, so some, what some users do is they save a file with all the layer effects and they flatten it and have a second file. Um, but the other option is, and we can talk about that uh, from with one of our designers, is by storing those layer effects inside of a smart object, inside of a Photoshop, you can actually retain the the layer effects, but when you import into Storyboard, we'll get the exact look that we're expecting. Okay, great. And there's a question, how easy is it to create custom widgets? Um, yeah, it's it's very easy. I didn't really show it in here. Um, we are actually in our 5.0, we've done a big revamp inside of there where our new version will be coming out with a whole bunch of custom widgets, so we have an idea. And we used to call them, uh, we changed the name, but now they're called components. Um, and what it is, is once a designer, so if you took, for instance, that button that I made with the glow, you can actually save that as a component, and it'll save it into a sort of self-compressed, uh, I mean, a compressed file format that's standalone that you can actually pass into new designs. And the animations are carried with it. If there's scripting parts that you've put on, it's carried with it, and all the uh, assets are carried with it, so you can actually drag and drop it, which is which is really awesome because if you're gonna, you know, if you're doing very large applications or you have multiple applications and you want a unique feel, you know, maybe, you know, my company, this is what our buttons look like, this is what our dialogues look like, this is what you can actually make those all components inside of Storyboard. So when somebody goes to make a new UI, they can just drag and drop them out from there. And the behavior will already be tied to it and it'll have the exact look and feel they're expecting. Okay, and there's a question if the calendar that you were showing, if that is a rich widget that would automatically lay out each month and such? Uh, that one wasn't. No, that was... Uh, so once again, we're not widgets. So we start a little bit different. So, you know, if you're used to QT, just to give you an idea, QT has the idea of widgets. Um, you know, they're, they're a code-based thing. So you drag out a widget and then you customize the widget to look like what you want. But the widget has a look. If you want to see, like, the big difference between Storyboard is just it's, it's very subtle, but we start with design we say, here's your look, let's add behavior, where they say, here's your behavior, try and add your look. Um, 
it's a subtle twist in logic, um, but we find adding the behavior is usually a lot faster because they have all these custom widgets, but you end up carrying them around and you may use three of them. The UIs today are so unique and everybody's product is trying so hard to be unique that common widgets usually aren't used because whatever your designer gave you doesn't look like it. And you spend a lot of time and resources trying to make this widget look like what your designer did. And this is where a lot of compromise comes in because sooner or later you just say, well, what this widget does is close enough, so this is what we'll do because that's easier. Um, we do it a little bit differently. But once again, the components that I was talking about, we don't have a calendar one, but we have one for keyboards and such like that. And, you know, it could easily be flipped to a calendar layout one too. It's the same idea. Okay. And um, you mentioned Qt, and um, there's also a question if it's possible to integrate um, you know, the GUI created with Crank with a Qt application. Yeah, and we have users doing that today. Um, we have shown on our blog in the past how we could actually run inside of Qt. Uh, we have users who use Qt for the OS layer um, to give them abstraction. Um, so because like Qt is not just a UI tool, it is also an OS abstraction tool. Um, so we do have customers today who their sort of business logic is done in Qt, but then they message back and forth to us. Uh, we also have customers who for um, usually performance reasons or development reasons have switched to using us, but they have so much in Qt that we have taken over some of their screens and they're still using a hybrid solution with Qt because for some of the back-end menus and such where that's, the presentation isn't as important, they still use the QT stuff, and that was mainly just out of time constraints. Um, but we have multiple customers doing things like, like that where they, they're, you know, they've invested so much into QT, but they, they see the change needs to happen. Um, so, you know, there's no reason to throw away all of QT or anything like that, and we can work directly with QT. We can render into it, and QT widgets can actually render into us. We have ways to do that. Um, I mean, if you searched our blog, you could probably find us talking about that. Um, but yeah, there is there is ways that we can collaborate. It seems like we're natural competitors, but I do have a lot of hybrid solutions where we actually work directly with them. Okay, and um, you mentioned uh, Storyboard IO, and um, I'm just curious how that. Um, what the APIs are like for tying in the hardware support um, in terms of uh, events associated with the UI and uh, the interaction with the hardware. And, and maybe on a similar note here, there's a question about how <clears throat> or if there are examples online of how to integrate events with, uh, with the graphical interface. Uh, yeah, they're both. Um, so if you download, I mean, just I can flip out of here, um, inside of our application. So if somebody had our stuff right now and they downloaded our eval, if they just said uh, import, um, there is storyboard samples. And inside of there, they can actually see a live example. There's multiple, but there's one called thermostat.io, which if you looked at it, actually gives you the C source code to how our stuff works too. So if you came back to the navigator view here and looked at this guy, um, there's a source code directory and some readmes and everything showing you how it all comes together and you can compile that. Our storyboard IO is really a messaging API that serializes and then runs over another native API. We didn't go make our own messaging system on top of every operating system. We write on top of something that's available and tested and validated. So on Linux we'd run on Sys5 messages, on QNIX we run on MQs, on Windows I think it's mailboxes, you know. Um, some of the smaller systems it might even just be a shared memory buffer. Um, so it, it and then it just gives you a common way to how you send these messages and you compile in this way. It'll even abstract you. So if you want to run on top of, you know, maybe on your desktop for simulation purposes, you generate your own simulator to generate all the real feedback. You can actually run it on you know, your desktop and it's the exact same API on your underlying system. So, you know, once again, it, it, it just rides on top of a native API. So it could be TCP IP, it could be anything it doesn't really matter to us. And, you know, if you think about how Sys5 messages or MQ work, um, it's exactly that. We have a, you know, a send and a receive. Um, so. Okay. And there there was actually a question specifically about ThreadX, which you mentioned earlier, um, and what the integration work is required there. Um, yeah. Um, ThreadX probably isn't listed on our website yet, but we uh, already have users using it and it'll be coming out. 
um, so it should be posted soon. Um, when you move away to an MCU level process and stuff, it, there is there is integration work, so it's a little bit different than what we show on like a Linux or QNIX system or Integrity and such. Um, those guys have a defined uh, touchscreen interface and described. Here's how you talk to the LCD and such. Um, when you go to some of those smaller systems, they don't uh, have that or they don't provide them to us. Uh, so what that means is, you know, there's an LCD driver configuration and such has to be done. Uh, you know, and, and the guys who use those operating systems are usually quite familiar and aware of this. It's just there is some integration work that has to be done. How do we get our input events? Where do we draw to? Things like that. And if there's uh, some integration work for custom platforms. Okay, great. Well, I think that does it for our questions today. Again, I want to thank you, Jason, for joining us and providing this uh, presentation on the uh, Crank Storyboard Suite. And if anybody has any additional questions or if we didn't get your question answered, um, feel free to contact us, um, either um, Crank Software or Tordex. We'd be happy to make sure we answer any questions you still have. And um, again, I want to thank you. and. Um, have a great day, and I'll let Jason close if he has anything he would like to add. No, I just wanted to say once again, thanks Tordex and NXP. I uh, also helped out on this webinar, too. Um, thanks so much for, you know, giving us the, uh, the this place to talk and show what we do. You know, I think we have a, a unique solution. It's different than what people are used to, and, you know, so a lot of it is just showing what we can do so people can understand, and, uh, and then uh, take that next step in downloading an eval. But, uh, yes, thanks again for all the help. Okay, bye-bye.